All right, so welcome everybody to module two. So hopefully you went over your uh, orientation module and you kind of got your grips around the way the course is going to be organized. Uh, if you have any questions about that, please send me an email and we can get that straightened out. And so now we're going to start off with our material. We're gonna start off with chapter one where we're discussing human biology, the basics of human biology. We'll talk about the process of science, and then we'll also talk about how society is related to how we think about science and how you as um, um, the public can actually, it's, it's actually your job to think critically about the information that's public, published in the science community and that you actually should question and think about everything you read that is from the scientific community uh, and to you know, undergo critical thinking processes about that information so that you can understand whether or not information that you're reading about research or um, any other thing in the scientific world uh, is actually credible or not. And you can kind of identify that yourself. So some key concepts that we're going to start out with is that with biology, we are classifying living organisms. Okay, so biology is the study of living organisms, it's the study of life. And in this part of biology, we have human biology where humans are just one of these several million different species of, of life forms that exist around the world. And science as a process is where we study the natural world. And science can be divided up into multiple different fields. Uh, so like geology, paleontology, biology, um, and biology can be broken down into a lot of different subfields. So like evolution, microbiology, ecology, human biology, right? Which is what we're gonna focus on for this class. And science again is, is where we study the natural world and science is there to help us understand what is. It's, science is not there to tell us how things should be. So if you hear anybody say, science says that this should be like this, that's not, that's not how science should be used. Science should be used to critically analyze or, or understand processes that are happening in the natural world and understand how those processes work so we can understand how it actually happens, how it works, how it functions and how it all communicates together. And, and that's what science is there to be used for. And the last thing we're gonna talk about is that science in science, we make choices and we can critically think about and analyze the information that we're given from the scientific community. And so just to start off, what is science, right? So we've already mentioned it's a study of the natural world. And so science studies all the matter that's on the globe and in the universe and the energy that's contained within it. And what we can also look at is how science impacts your everyday life. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, as we go through this class. And so then we can say, what is biology? And really I defined this in the last slide, but it's basically the study of living organisms and those processes that are associated with those living organisms. So essentially human biology then is a division or a subdivision of biology and is really an interdisciplinary field. Interdisciplinary meaning that it takes information from a lot of different fields of biology and combines them to create the field of human biology. So human biology is where we're studying humans, the species Homo sapiens, through the, through the fields of genetics, evolution, anatomy, physiology, microbiology, right? We're taking all of those fields and the information that they contain about humans and using that to study humans. And that's what human biology is. 
And now in order to get to the point of, of the biology aspect, right? So we're saying biology is the study of living things, of living organisms, okay? Then we can ask, well, how do we classify something as living, right? So that's what we're gonna talk about next. So if we classify a thing in the world as a living organism, it has to have specific characteristics. So living things will have the following characteristics. So first, they have to have a molecular composition that is different from non-living things. And these are specifically looking at organic compounds, organic molecules. And we'll learn all about these organic molecules in the chemistry chapter. And we'll learn about their structures and their components and exactly what they do in the human body. But these macromolecules are proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids. So those are the four groups of uh, organic molecules that compose of uh, living organisms that we don't see in non-living things. Now, living organisms also require energy and raw materials to function. So they need raw materials to build those organic compounds like proteins and carbohydrates, and they need energy to build those molecules. And the process of cells building and breaking down proteins and carbohydrates and using up that energy and making energy to undergo those processes is called metabolism. And so metabolism is just broadly defined as the physical and chemical process of transforming energy and molecules in order to sustain that living organism. Another characteristic of, of living organisms are that they are composed of cells and that there is this organization to those cells and, and how they're organized in those living things, those living organisms. Another aspect of living organisms is that they can maintain a, home, a homeostatic environment. So they maintain homeostasis. And what homeostasis means is that they're basically just keeping a constant internal environment. And as you'll learn over the semester with humans, we need a really specific internal environment for our cells and all the other processes to function within our cells. Our blood has to be at a fairly neutral pH so that oxygen molecules can bind to our, our hemoglobin molecules. Our um, Cells need a certain salt concentration so that fluids can go into and out of like they're supposed to. Um, our enzymes need a certain body temperature in order to function properly or else they break down and denature. And all of that is maintained in our body through a lot of different cellular processes and physiological processes that we'll learn about as we talk about the organ systems uh, in, in the human, in the human body. Another factor of um, humans is that they have to respond to their external environment. So they respond to stimuli, um, meaning that if it's hot outside, an organism may seek shade. If it's cold outside, an organism may go into the sunlight. Um, if, you know, an organism sees a shadow, it may run away in response to that shadow. So they're responding to those external stimuli. Another aspect of living organisms is that they must grow and reproduce. So they have to grow in size and then they have to reproduce to create new, um, new copies of themselves or not necessarily identical copies, but new versions of themselves so that that population can continue to grow. Now, the final aspect of, of living organisms is that living organisms have to evolve. So populations of those living organisms will evolve over time. And we'll talk a little bit about this um, whenever we go through um, uh, one of the later lectures. 
or videos. But basically, whenever you have an organism, it's going to have certain characteristics. And those characteristics can be more beneficial compared to others. And those more beneficial characteristics will be favored in um, the population and that population will evolve. One of the big caveats to evolution and one of the, kind of, I should say, one of the big misconceptions of evolution is that a lot of the times the public will look at evolution as individuals evolving. So individuals can evolve, right? So me as a person, I can't evolve new characteristics or traits, right? And I can, however, have traits that are different from my members in the population. And if my traits are more favorable, then I'll be able to survive and, produce and reproduce much better than my neighbors. And so my traits will carry on and proliferate through the population. And so then over time, your population will evolve, but the individuals will not. So an example of this is, let's say, coat color in organisms. So let's say coat color in mice. So let's say you have a mouse population that lives on the beach and that beach has white sand. There are individuals in that mouse population that will have a dark coat color and they'll have a light coat color and any variation in between. The individuals that are better able to camouflage will survive and they'll reproduce because they'll be able to hide from predators. So what you would see over time is that if you release 50% white coat color and 50% dark coat color into a population, over time that population will become more and more prominent of white coat color individuals, maybe like 90% white coat color or 95% white coat color. And so that means the population is evolving to have white coat colors instead of dark coat colors, right? Because of selective pressures. And so that's what we mean by populations evolving, not individuals. And that is a big, um, a big concept that you need to understand uh, when it comes to this idea of living things evolving. And so throughout a lot of our lectures or all of our lectures, I'll have videos that are interspersed through here and um, they'll just reiterate some of the things that I've said and um, I'll play these videos for you all. And uh, it just kind of gives you a different way to, to look at the information and to kind of take it in. While there is a tremendous diversity of life on earth, all living things, bacteria, archaea, Protists, fungi, plants, and animals share common traits that are associated with life. No single definition applies to all forms of life, so instead of defining life, we can only characterize it. Most biologists agree that in general, the following statements characterize life. First, living things contain nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. The nucleic acid DNA Deoxyribonucleic acid is especially important because DNA molecules can be replicated, an ability that enables organisms to reproduce themselves. Second, living things are composed of cells. Cells are the smallest units of life. Some organisms have only a single cell. Others are multicellular. Humans, for example, are composed of trillions of cells. Third, living things reproduce. Living things have ways of generating new individuals that carry some of the genetic material of the parents. Some organisms, such as bacteria, reproduce simply by making new and virtually exact copies of themselves. Fourth, living things use energy and raw materials. Through metabolic activities, organisms extract energy from various nutrients and transform it to do many kinds of work, allowing the organism to maintain life and grow. Fifth, living things respond. A snail, for example, detects the pressure of touch and responds by retracting into its shell. Sixth, living things maintain homeostasis, the relatively constant and self-correcting internal environment of a living organism. A snake remains cool by finding shade, a behavioral means of maintaining homeostasis. Animals also have physiological means to maintain homeostasis, for example, humans sweat to remain cool. 
Seventh, populations of living things evolve and have adaptive traits. In a process called natural selection, members of a population possessing beneficial genetic traits will survive and reproduce better than members of the population that lack these traits. In the case of the giraffe, a classic explanation for the long neck is that it's an adaptive trait for eating leaves that other animals may not be able to reach. Another explanation, however, is that male giraffes with longer necks can win fights with males having shorter necks and thereby gain greater access to females. All right, <clears throat> so that video just kind of summarizes the characteristics of, of living organisms. And so once we have looked at an organism and saw that it has the characteristics to classify it as being alive, we then take all of the living organisms and group them into a hierarchical grouping that um, groups them based off of different characteristics. And this hierarchical grouping has several different uh, levels. And the upper level, which is the most inclusive grouping, is known as the domain level. So the domains have the most amount of species within that group. There are three domains that encompass all of living things in the world. The first domain is bacteria. The second domain is archaea. And the third domain is eukarya. Bacteria and archaea are made up of single-celled organisms, which are known as prokaryotes. The domain eukarya is, known, is made up of some single cell organisms and then mostly multicellular organisms. And all of the organisms in the domain eukarya are known as eukaryotes. And we'll learn all about the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes in a little bit, but basically it's eukaryotes, much more complex at the cellular level, larger. They have organelles, they have a nucleus, whereas prokaryotes are single-celled. They are much smaller, less complex. They don't have membrane-bound organelles. They don't have a nucleus that contains the DNA. And so they're much different in terms of cellular composition. So you have your three domains, bacteria, archaea. So those are your single-celled. And then your eukaryotes, your, your domain eukarya, which are your eukaryotic cell. The domain eukarya is broken down into four subgroups, which are known as kingdoms, and that is the next level on the hierarchy. And so within the kingdom, in, in eukaryotes, you have those four kingdoms. You have the, pro, the protus kingdom, the animal kingdom, the fungi kingdom, and the plant kingdom. And so if we look at a figure of a very broad tree of life, you have your domain bacteria, your domain archaea, and then your domain eukarya. And then the eukaryotes split into the four kingdoms, um, the protists, the animals, the fungi, and the plants. And then each of these kingdoms separate into even stricter categories or even stricter levels, which we'll talk about in a little bit, until you get down to a single species. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, so we got that coming up here. Okay. So the big criteria that we use for classifying an organism is we look at it and we say, okay, does it have a nucleus or not? So if it does not have a membrane-bound nucleus, it's either in the domain bacteria or archaea. If it has a membrane-bound nucleus, it's in the eukaryotes. <clears throat> we have also look at the number of cells. If it's unicellular, it's most likely bacteria and archaea, although there are some eukaryotes that are single-celled cellular, like a, a protist, 
And then if it's multicellular, definitely a eukaryote. And then we look at the different types of metabolism, so how they obtain and break down food in order to determine the type of group they're in. So for example, looking at the different types of metabolism in the animal kingdom, or I'm sorry, in the um, domain eukarya, the kingdom protus are um, unicellular, they're simple multicellular, and then they're uh, eukaryotic, right? So all of these are going to be eukaryotic because they're in the domain eukarya. Protus again are either unicellular or simple multicellular. So uh, protus are things like algae, slime molds, those types of organisms. Plants are multicellular, eukaryotic, and then their form of metabolism is photosynthesis, right? So they use photosynthesis to make organic uh, molecules which they use to get energy. So they make uh, starch and glucose um, uh, it, so that they can then break that glucose down in order to get ATP. Animals, however, are heterotrophic. So they cannot make their own organic molecules. We have to eat organic molecules and consume them to put in our body so that we can break down those molecules in order to get our energy. So that's heterotrophic. Fungi are eukaryotic decomposers. So they break down organic material and use that organic material that they're breaking down that's no longer living to get energy from those organic molecules. Okay, so these are some of the characteristics that we can use to kind of put organisms in these four kingdoms. Of course, when you, you try to identify a new species, it's much more complicated than that. But this kind of gives you a general idea of where they may go based on their um, general characteristics. And you can get pretty close uh, in terms of the kingdom in, in, in which they are um, involved in or, or part of by going through those classifications. Now, this is the remaining uh, classification levels. So we've talked about domain. We talked about the four kingdoms. And then after the kingdoms, we have phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So every organism in the world falls under a specific group in every one of these classification hierarchies, okay? So if we look at humans, humans are in the domain eukarya because we are multicellular, we have a nucleus, a nuclear membrane. Um, we are in the kingdom animalia because we're heterotrophic. We're in the phylum chordata because we have chordate characteristics. There are four characteristics, which is like a notochord, pharyngeal heel slits, a postanal tail, and um, a dorsal hollow nerve cord. We're in the class mammalia because we have mammary glands and we have hair. We're in the order of primates because we have primate characteristics. We're in the family uh, hominid, hominidae because we have hominid characteristics, which are different characteristics from other ancient humans, um, which is very interesting if you're interested in that. National Geographic has a really good write-up on it. You can email me and I can send it to you. And then within the family, that we're also in the genus Homo, and there are actually several different Homo species that have lived at one point in time throughout um, the evolutionary history of the family, uh, the hominid family. And so for example, there's, we are Homo sapiens. And so sapien is our species name, but there has also existed Homo erectus, Homo florensis, um, uh, Homo neanderthal, <coughs> not Homo neanderthal, man, that's very bad. Forget I said that. But again, so Homo sapiens, Homo erectus, Homo florensis, Homo heidelbergensis, there we go. That's the one I was thinking about. Neanderthals is a, is a different, different grouping. Um, but basically, 
we have this specific hierarchy in which every organism will fall with. Right? Um, and the way to remember this hierarchy is I use a saying, and I, I go with, and some of you may have heard other ones before, but what I go with is Deer King Philip came over for great soda. So Deer is domain, King is kingdom, Philip is phylum, came as class, over is order, for is family, great is uh, genus, and soda is species. Okay. But now, whenever we say, whenever we say a species name, you write its binomial name. All right, so this is the binomial name. Um, and so it's Homo sapiens, so it's genus and species put together. Genus is always capitalized, species is always lowercase, and they're written in italics, which is why I underline them. Right? So if you write it by hand, you always want to underline it so you can represent that it's supposed to be in italics. Um, let's see, so for example, um, the species of uh, a wolf is Canis lupus, right? So genus is the Canis, species is the lupus. We have capital genus, lowercase uh, species. <clears throat> and then that would be in the family, uh, I can't actually remember the family, but it would be in the order of the canids. Um, and so it would go up that way, right? And um, so, yeah, so that's the classification of humans. And this is also referred to as taxonomy. Okay. And so this slide kind of goes into that in a little more detail. So here we have the smallest unit of classification is a species, so that's one species, right? So Homo sapiens is one species, but the genus Homo has multiple species. The family, um, the Hominidae family has multiple genera, and then the um, order mammal, Mammalia, has multiple genera or multiple families, right? And so each uh, succession on the hierarchy gets more and more specific as you go down. And the smallest uh, classification has similar physical and functional characteristics. And the key definition for a species is that they can, that the individuals in that population can interbreed with one another and produce fertile offspring. So that's the biological species concept, is that those individuals can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. The second smallest unit of that classification system, like we mentioned, is genus. So all human beings belong to the same genus and the same species. And again, that's the binomial, binomial name, right? So that's the genus name and the species name, okay? All right, so next we're going to go into some defining features of humans. What really sets humans apart from other related organisms are these four characteristics. First is bipedalism, the ability to stand on two legs, walk upright, and uh, have that mobility that comes with being, being bipedal. Also, having opposable thumbs just gives us an extreme amount of dexterity that even our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, don't have. Um, we have an image in the next slide that I'll show you um, the difference between that. But basically, with opposable thumbs, you can take your thumb and your index finger and you can put those two tips together, whereas all other species can't do that. They can't put those two tips together and that results in a less dexterous hand, um, hand movement or hand function. We also have really large brain sizes relative to our body size. 
and then we also have the capacity for language, both spoken and written language. Now there are animals that communicate, but their communication um, isn't as complex as, as the communication of, of humans. Um, and, and these four factors are a really big impact on, on or a really big reason as to why humans are so successful. Um, this is just an image showing the difference in the hand. You can see that contact there, right? So that's the opposable thumbs, whereas chimpanzees don't have that contact. Right? So a chimp is not going to be very good at holding a sewing needle and thread, you know, threading it and, and sewing because they lack that dexterity with their thumb and their index finger. And you can see there's a very different structure here. Uh, compared to uh, chance and humans. And so again, it's just a characteristic that homo sapiens have that gives them um, kind of an advantage under certain situations, okay? All right, so that's it for this video. Um, and generally what I'll do is I'll break up each chapter into smaller videos so that you can kind of take them as at bite size. And so you don't have to sit down and, and watch like an hour hour and a half video at the same time. Um, I'll break them up into like 20, 30 minute videos um, and put them all together so that you can, can go over the, the chapters in each module that way. And so that's it for the first video for this module. The next video will go through uh, the human biological organization and so how that hierarchy goes through. Um, and then we'll have another video where we talk about science and the process of science and kind of how we go about that. And so that's it for this video on chapter one. We'll see you in the second video for, for this chapter.